right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Emily with Broker Online Exchange, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our June Energy Market Intelligence webinar. I'd like to start off with a quick poll again, just to get a feel for who our audience is today. So take a look at the question and let us know what your role is in the energy industry. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm gonna go ahead now and turn it over to our energy market analysts, Elliot Chorn and Joe Prozac. Hi everyone, this is uh, Elliot Chorn with True Light Energy. Uh, I'm joined today by Joe Prozac, uh, who is on our wholesale desk here at True Light Energy. Um, very excited to tell you about uh, some of the current things going on in the market uh, and also start to talk a little bit out into the, some of the uh, future trends and opportunities that we see for uh, managing risk for your ultimate end user customers. Um, as always, uh, highly encourage any questions uh, that you may have that may come up throughout this conversation to be submitted uh, via the GoToMeeting uh, application. Uh, as we move through this, we will uh, aim to take care of all of those questions, uh, and if they're not addressed, then uh, your account manager at Broker Online Exchange will follow up with those. Um, so with that, we can, uh, Emily, move to the, the first slide. Um, obviously, we're, we're starting to get into the dog days of summer, uh, depending on where you are in the U.S. Uh, it's obviously starting to warm up. Um, there is some predictions for some uh, above normal heat coming over the next few weeks. Um, but with that being said, uh, no particular volatility in natural gas markets. Uh, natural gas markets uh, obviously are what uh, what drive um, our electricity markets um, due to the heavy reliance uh, on natural gas for power generation. Um, in the short term, uh, gas prices, uh, really little to no volatility. Um, that has translated over into short term power prices, uh, kind of month over month. Uh, there's been a little bit of a sell off. Uh, but not even a full percentage point. Uh, the one market that that is, does not hold true in is uh, Texas, where there's been a pretty significant sell-off, um, particularly on the August contract, uh, due to you know kind of a lack of volatility in Texas. Some of the fear uh, that power prices were going to push up into that $9,000 range um, that has not uh, presented itself yet. So there's been a little bit of a sell-off in the Texas market. Uh, other markets are pretty flat. Um, Joe, anything to add on kind of short-term gas, near-term gas markets? Um, on, with regards to short-term gas, I mean, you really said it, uh, short-term gas in the summer isn't going to really move power prices on the board for over the next couple of months. Um, so, and traditionally, you're not really getting gas influencing the power markets at all in the summer. So we're looking more for, um, for heat-driven demand. Um, that cooling load, especially in the Northeast and, and down in Texas as well. Um, but when we're looking out a little bit further onto the curve, um, heading into the, the fall and the winter, there's so thinking a little bit more forward, um, we do see uh, some opportunities and some potential for volatility uh, on the gas market and how that would translate into uh, power prices. And you can kind of see the, the beginning evidence of that on this curve right here, just on the chart in front of you, look at those run-ups um, right around January 2017 and Jan 2018. Heading into the winter, gas always gets a little bit more expensive due to that, um, due to that heating demand uh, in the Northeast um, for natural gas. So uh, right now, keep, just put in the context that winter prices for a Henry Hub, uh, which is the prevailing um, liquid natural gas product that you see charted here, um, they're currently trading around 317, whereas last winter they would run up closer to four dollars or at least over three and a half. So we're definitely looking at uh, perhaps a little bit of an undervalued winter. Yeah. 
so if, as you look at this slide, and then, uh, you know, you can see that there's any spikes really are occurring in the winter time period. You know, January of 2018, you can see a spike, January, February, uh, and then a sell-off as you kind of go into the, the shoulder season and then the summer. Um, same thing, you know, uh, January, February of 2017, you see the same pattern. And Emily, if you go to the, the next slide, you even see that same kind of volatility in the, the spot market. Um, this last winter, obviously, there was a, a, a giant spike in, in power, uh, uh, gas prices up to, you know, almost $7 uh, on the spot market, which is that ultra short-term market, not even traded on the futures exchange, but really what it costs to buy gas off the pipeline. Uh, and a similar spike in, in January of uh, 17. Um, with all that being said, as we go to the, the next slide, um, we start to talk about where our uh, where we are in terms of storage. So every Thursday, the EIA releases a uh, a natural gas storage uh, report, and that gives the previous week tells you how much gas uh, was put into or taken out of storage. Um, historically, winter is withdrawal season; summer is injection season. Uh, this year, we had a, a, an abnormally cold. Uh, April, May, and so we saw withdrawal season kind of extend a little further out uh, than it typically does. Um, with that, we are below the five-year average pretty significantly, and even bouncing against uh, kind of the five-year low. Uh, so looking at historically over the past five years, where we've been uh, at this time of the year, we're near that five-year low. Now, if you go back five years in time, if we were in the same situation, natural gas prices would be reacting very, very strongly. So historically, uh, low storage has equaled high gas prices. So there's a, been a very strong correlation between uh, gas storage and gas prices. But we're not seeing that under the current market. And there's a couple of different reasons for that uh, that Joe and I are going to try to try to tack off here. Um, the first of which is just the immense amount of supply that is available. Um, natural gas producers uh, are prolific. Um, there are a lot of wells that have been drilled. The technology to drill those wells uh, allows for a lot more responsiveness. So when gas prices start to go up or there is a need for additional production, uh, they're able to, to kind of open the spigot very quickly and flood the market with that gas. Um, gas producers aren't going to produce down into that $2 range because it's not profitable for them. So as long as gas prices are hanging around in that $270 to $3 range, there's uh, 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 supply and demand are equaling out at that point. Um, if we were to see, you know, we come out towards the end of the summer, we're still running a, a pretty significant deficit. We could start to see that winter uh, of 2019 or tw winter of 2018, 2019, uh, prices start to react to that. Um, any type of, uh, any opportunity that gas traders can find to, to bring some volatility in the market, they're going to take that. They're going to try to make their money. And that's for producers, consumers, anybody that's trading gas is looking for that opportunity. Um, and so if we're, if we're still in this kind of severe deficit, situation compared to the five-year average as we exit the, the summer and start to really look into that uh, flipping back into that withdrawal season when the cold weather comes in, we could see some pretty significant upside, um, whereas now we're seeing that pretty steady $3 gas range. Joe, anything to add on kind of the supply demand? Oh, yeah. If you were to think back to that last slide that we just showed you when we had that massive spike in Jan 18 and then even Jan 17, uh, not as big of a spike, but certainly a, a run-up on the spot. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Emily. Um, so you see those two uh, price run-ups. To put that in context, going into the winter or going into Jan 17 and Jan 18, both times, we were running a surplus against the uh, five-year average for storage, which means to say at where we're standing right now at this point in time. Uh, so in the middle of the summer in, in 2017 and then in 2016, we were running above the five-year averages and we still got uh, those price run-ups and especially that big blast up in uh, 2018, just about six months ago with that big run-up on gas. Um, we were sitting pretty nice on, on the storage. So 
consider where we're at right now, running that deficit against the five-year average, getting close to the five-year min as it is, um, and keeping in mind the volatility that we've seen in markets where storage hasn't been an issue in the last couple of years, um, you certainly are facing more upside risk than downside risk. And it's not to say that we're, we're poised for a big blowout this winter um, due to the things we were discussing earlier on why prices aren't reacting to the low storage number, but we can see the potential for that upside to come through. And if it were to come through, it wouldn't be unreasonable to see something like what we saw in January. So that's kind of where the risk is setting up. Um, and, and to kind of put a little more general terms, uh, where we're at right now for gas in the winter with, again, Henry Hub down in the 317 for January, but just over three for December and February. Um, this could be the lowest point or one of the low points in the market. It could go down a little bit further from there, but uh, not much further. And there's more potential for those contracts to move upwards closer to three and a half and, and even four. Yeah, just to, to reiterate Joe's point, kind of our point of view, you know, it's we're in the summer. Any risk that your your customers have on the table in terms of not having a contract fixed in at this point in time for the summertime uh, is kind of difficult to deal with. Um, you know, obviously you can always put them into a contract. Um, you're not going to hurt them by taking that risk off the table. But as we start to look out a little bit further into the future, um, customers that have exposure, so contracts that are rolling off in the fall and the winter, particularly of, of 2018-19, it's really not a bad time right now to be looking to, to take some of that risk off the table and to get contracts in place for those time periods. Again, we don't see any, um, any magnitude of, of, of downside opportunity. No expectation that, that gas prices are going to fall off and therefore power prices are going to fall off the cliff and customers are going to be shaking their fist at you saying, why did you lock me in when you did? Um, we see, uh, if not all of the risk, the vast majority of prices increasing as we enter or as we exit the, the summer storage injection period at a deficit to the five-year average. Um, compounded with that is, is always uh, hurricane season, uh, not as big of an issue as it's been in the past. Uh, it used to be that the Gulf of Mexico is where the vast majority of our natural gas uh, in the United States was produced, uh, and that's why Henry Hub is that kind of benchmark pricing point. It's off the coast of Louisiana. Um, the way things have changed with fracking and so much of the natural gas coming out of the you know, kind of Pennsylvania, Ohio regions, uh, hurricane season is not as much of an issue. But again, if there's any, you know, production constraints coming out of the Gulf of Mexico, that's going to, you're going to see prices spike up, uh, even if it's just in the short term and, you know, you know, panic buying can start to set in. Um, so again, our, our encouragement is to start looking to take uh, fall and winter of 2018, 2019 uh, risk off the table, start to cover those, those exposures uh, and, and see if there's opportunities to lock in at a good price. Um, as we go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about short-term weather. Um, there's been some pretty uh, bombastic headlines uh, that I've seen, uh, you know, in terms of weather predictions over the next couple of weeks. Um, that July 4th week in particular, you know, potential for record heat, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and that, this map obviously shows that, you know, this is our, our 8 14 day outlook. Um, the darker the red, the more likely it is going to be above normal. Uh, and then blue is obviously the converse of that. As you can see, basically across the entire United States, outside of the Pacific Northwest, um, we are expecting above normal temperatures. Uh, early on in the week, there were people talking, you know, 100, 105 up here in New England where we are, which would be uh, almost unheard of. I mean, that would be record setting heat uh, in a true heat wave. Um, Expectations have moderated a little bit on that just due to the fact that there's a significant amount of moisture uh, still on the ground. There's no real drought conditions uh, across the United States. Um, the more moist it is, the less likely temperatures are to rise, but you are going to see that kind of heat index or the, uh, the real field temperature, what it feels like due to humidity, uh, push into that 100, 105. So we're expecting a pretty significant cooling degree day. Um, uh, event over the next 
seven to 10 days. Uh, and that will obviously drive up kind of our, our ultra short term spot market prices. Um, you'll start to see some of those LMP prices really start to bounce around and react to that. Um, and then as we go to the next slide and we start to look at, you know, kind of our longer term weather, still hot, right? Expectations are for a hot summer. Um, that's going to continue to, to provide that kind of bottom to gas prices of, you know, we're not going to see it drop down below that you know, I would say 270, 260 on really the low end uh, with the amount of, of gas that's going to need to be burned to keep air conditioning running. Um, and then, you know, no real consensus start forming as of yet looking into the fall and winter uh, as to what the, the um, projections are going to be. You know, with weather, you know, nobody likes their, their, you know, their, their local weather forecaster, right? The guy's always wrong. Uh, and the further out we go, the worse it gets. So we can pretty accurately predict temperature within, you know, a 24 to 48 hour period. As we start to look out past that, temperature becomes less and less predictable. Um, precipitation is even difficult in that 24 to 48 hour period. Um, you know, the 8 to 10 day, you can start to see some of the big pressure systems, and therefore you can see how temperatures might move as a result of that. But you get much further out than that, and you're... Uh, there's a lot of modeling and, and high-end mathematics done to try to predict it, but they become less and less accurate. So we always try to look at what's happening in the next, you know, two weeks uh, and feel relatively confident about that. And then looking further out, you know, kind of that three-month outlook of, of what's overall predictions for the next three months. Uh, Joe, anything to add on weather? Yeah, uh, don't, we don't want to underplay the uh, the risks that we are facing for the beginning of July. That is pretty incredible heat, but um, this is the kind of heat that the market prices into the forward contract. So for July, August, and even a little bit of September, like the market's already expecting at least one of these waves, if not more. Um, so that that's already kind of built into the price. So even if we do see a little bit of volatility in the real time market um, on the LMP. That's kind of something that we're already expecting to see. You need to see some tremendous volatility, um, uh, abnormally high prices in order to really start moving these near term markets. And even if you were to see that, that wouldn't really bear any influence on the rest of the forward curve, like going into the winter where gas becomes a much bigger player. The one last thing I would want to add on this long term weather chart that we're looking at is that above normal temperature slated for September. So this does go out to a September outlook, and in September is traditionally where a lot of those temperatures begin to drop and we get into more of a, or the beginning of a fall pattern, and that's also the same time where the ISO, so PGM, ERCOT, or um, uh, New England and New York, they'll begin to take some generators out of the stack, and the transmission companies will begin to take some lines out, uh, out of service and begin doing some maintenance on them. So as you see those transmission generation outages begin to creep up, which usually occurs um, in the second or even third week of September, if that's overlapping with any above normal heat, you could be subjected to some real-time price volatility. We did see that happen last fall and a little bit of it the previous fall in 2016. So September can be uh, a relatively risky month depending on how things play out. But as it stands, you need some pretty incredible heat again and at that point to really drive that kind of volatility. Um, in this chart, though, it hints towards it. It's not um, a sure bet by any means. Uh, as we go to the next slide, um, talk a little bit about headroom, um, which the bad news is there isn't a lot of it. Um, headroom, uh, as we always talk about, is the, the opportunity to sell savings against the utilities price. So utilities have to sell power. Uh, outside of Texas, they have to provide like a, a provider of last resort or a, a basic service type of rate. Um, they're not allowed to turn a profit off of it, so they're really just buying based on a, a set schedule of purchases. Um, what we're looking at here is uh, Commonwealth Electric Company, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, it's an Eversource, uh, one of the Eversource uh, distribution companies. So Eversource is kind of your Boston proper uh, area, um, and a G2 is our kind of general commercial rate class here, and this is really one of the best opportunities that we're seeing for headroom. 
Uh, and as you can see, you know, the blue line represents what the price to compare is, so what the utility is offering, and the green line is our representation uh, or our calculation of what retail supply contracts should be sold at with uh, an expected uh, retail margin on top of them. Um, and there's really only headroom in the short term. Uh, as we look out into the longer term, so we get out of the summer period into the, the, the uh, fall and winter uh, on a longer term contract, um, the headroom opportunities really disappear. That's not to say that as uh, Eversource switches from their summer rates, which we're obviously using now, to their winter rates, there won't be headroom opportunities. This is really the story across the United States. Um, the way that, uh, in, in deregulated markets, the way that utilities purchase power on those kind of set schedules, um, they were buying a lot of this power, you know, spring of last year when prices were really low. Uh, they were buying it in the fall of last year, finishing up those purchases the spring of this year where prices were very low. Uh, and there's just been uh, very little upside volatility they, that, where the utilities have had to buy at higher prices. And so there aren't any true headroom opportunities. With that being said, that doesn't mean that uh, a retail contract is a bad idea. Um, for example, you know, we're looking at Eversource in Massachusetts. Uh, as I alluded to, there is a summer rate and a winter rate. The summer rate is always significantly lower than the winter rate. I have Eversource at my house. Um, my power bill is, you know, cut in half, not only on volume, but also on uh, price in the summertime. Then, as we go into the winter, prices spike up. Uh, so one of the things that uh, offering a longer-term fixed contract can do to, for your customers is take that exposure to the volatility of the market off the table, which is always a really good selling point, that while the market might seem stable now and therefore present a good buying opportunity, the market is never stable. It's always moving. Um, Joe watches the, the short-term market very closely every day. And, you know, he sees $100 price swings happen on LMP markets on a regular basis. Um, and so any volatility, any, uh, any risk management, which is really what a fixed contract is going to provide, it's going to take the risk of exposure to, a, to the more volatile spot market off of the table, is still a good opportunity for customers. Prices are good. Um, again, we don't see a whole lot of additional downside out there to the to prices um, we only see some potential upside to prices not to say that they're going to occur um, but if you can talk to your customers and explain to them that you know it's a good time to buy and that prices are, are good uh, prices are at a low low point um, and that any risk that they're facing is not that they're going to lock in at a high price. They're not buying when it's $5 gas. They're buying when it's 270 gas. Uh, we're not going to see a dollar gas, but we could see that $5 gas again. So that's really the story that uh, I would be talking to my customers about is that it, the, the market's in a good position currently, and any future risks are to the upside. Gas producers aren't going to do this for free. And therefore, power prices are going to stay in this same kind of wholesale, you know, 30 to 40 to 50 dollar range um, across all terms, uh, unless they go higher. They're not going to go lower. Is really the the story of today. Um, as we go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about some of the the electricity forward curves uh, and what we've seen going on. Um, so this is NEMAS, uh, Northeastern Mass, which is that same Eversource service area. Uh, you can see going back into that poor vortex time period, uh, prices were, you know, $80, $85 since then. They've really settled down other than some seasonal volatility. Um, you, you know, if you look back, it's again that January, February, even in the March time frame where you see prices jump up a little bit. Um, and then now is that kind of prices have traded off a little into the spring, and they're in that kind of stability point, that 40 to $45 range uh, for NEMAS Boston. Uh, Joe, anything to add on, on uh, kind of what's going on in New England? Um, yeah, well, thinking a little bit further down the line, I'm sure you've heard in the news that there's a lot of uh, potential stack retirements or generation retirements from the stack uh, all across the Northeast uh, in New England's not um, not exempt from that, the Mystic Generating Station, 
which is located right outside Boston. I see it every morning on the drive in. Um, that's uh, they're they're essentially losing money every year, and they are now slated to retire in 2022. So this is thinking out a little bit further beyond, but uh, is more of a highlight of the context that we're looking at in terms of supply for the for the power market, especially during winters in places like New England, where it's really heavily dependent on natural gas. Um, the, the generation stack is in major flux and there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of proposals on the table to bail out um, Mystic and, and if you look further down outside of uh, New England into uh, uh, New York and, and especially PJM, a lot of nuclear and, and coal plants are trying to buy for some uh, either bailouts or in, in, in the case of the nukes, uh, zero energy credits or sorry, zero emissions credits. Um, so you have a lot of uncertainty on this front. If a lot of those uh, generators do leave the stack, you are, are certainly pre predisposed to a little bit more uh, upside volatility during the winter. Um, and right now, like the last couple of winters certainly dampened a lot of that um, that volatility on the forward curve. I think when we're looking out a little bit forward, uh, provide that uncertainty on the stack. That's certainly a, co a conversation you should have with your with your customers. Because no one really knows. We, we don't know if those generators are going to remain in the stack or not. Uh, I'm doubtful, uh, like, uh, even the regulators at this point even have a good picture of how that all is going to shake out. And we're not in the business of making those kind of predictions, but we do understand that if they do leave the stack, um, you are looking at more bullish pricing. And that's not quite yet reflected in these curves, in my opinion. So that's why I would think that you... Um, again, not no near-term concern, but looking out forward into the next 12 months and even beyond, if you have um, anything on the table, like a 36-month contract in New England, that's certainly a subject they should uh, be talking about with your customers, the potential retirement at the Mystic Generating Station. Uh, as we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll kind of look at the inverse of what's been happening in New England, uh, which is Texas. Uh, and it's a lot of what Joe's been talking about in terms of generator retirement. Uh, driving that. Uh, as you can see, prices really hovered around in that $30 to $35 range pretty consistently uh, over the past, you know, two years. Um, this spring, uh, there was announcements of some, uh, a pretty significant amount of coal generation, and you can see prices really start to run up, um, and this is for a 12-month uh, around-the-clock power strip. Uh, running up all the way up to like a, a $60, almost $60, so almost double what it's historically been at. Um, you know, we saw prices on the August contract pushing into like the $250 range, uh, which is extremely high. Um, prices that you, I, I frankly have never seen before um, for forward contracts. Um, you know, L&P prices do that with some regularity, but not forward contracts. And it was really all around the retirement of those uh those coal units, uh, when they retired, there was some significant concerns about reserve margins and how much, was there gonna be enough available power and how expensive was it gonna be to meet the needs of load? Um, and so you saw that big price run up. We've gone through you know, now late May, early June or most of June at this point. Uh, and there's been some you know, seasonal heat, nothing uh, extraordinary in Texas. And we haven't seen the price volatility that people were worried about. And so you started to see a pretty significant sell-off coming off that $60 range, you know, down into the $40 down range for a 12-month contract. Um, keep in mind that's only looking at this July and August uh, instead of having all three months of the summer like we did earlier this year. Um, so, you know, it, it really comes down to that generation stack and what's available uh, in Texas. You know, it's our expectation that there's going to continue to be uh, retirements of old thermal plants, so coal and natural gas, uh, as more and more renewables come on. There, there's another few hundred megawatts of uh, wind coming on this year, um, and then same thing next year and the following year. And as, as renewable assets come online, they're going to depress uh, wholesale LMP prices overall because there's no there's no fuel cost for them. They don't have to buy anything. Once they've installed the wind turbine, that's it. That's, that's, there's the capital expenditure. They don't have to buy fuel to produce power. They just produce power no matter how cheap it is. They'll do it for, you know, if you'll pay them a penny per megawatt hour, they'll produce power. Um, so in Texas, we've seen kind of the opposite where, you know, the uh, renewable assets combined with 
uh, you know, older thermal assets coming offline uh, have really driven some additional volatility that, while it hasn't materialized yet this summer, that's not to say that it's not still out there and, and not still a potential opportunity. Um, you know, August contract is traded off pretty significantly, but you know it's still in you know triple digits, uh, which is again a very high number uh, that you just don't see very often on forward contracts. Joe, anything I missed yeah. on that? So hop in there. Uh, you know, just taking a quick look at August, we're at around 150 right now um, for North Hub, which is uh, around the Dallas area. Um, fairly or very well correlated with the Houston uh, Houston trading point, which is what we see on the chart in front of us. So uh, a couple points that I did want to touch on. If you look out uh, forward into next summer, we are seeing forward prices that are still high, but it's like $80 versus $150. So it's literally half of what we are uh, looking at for this summer. And NERCA is kind of its own beast. The reason why it can get up to $9,000 in the real time energy market is because ERCOT doesn't have a capacity market like uh, most of the Northeast RTOs have or ISOs have. Um, so the generators need to see that incredibly expensive pricing in, in order to, to re recoup their investments and in, in order to actually make money. Whereas in PJM, the energy market doesn't need to be that expensive because they can get their stream of income from the capacity market. So ERCOT needs this volatility. The fact that we're not seeing it um, yet this summer has pushed back down that uh, 2019 summer curve a little bit. But the way that I would look at that is, okay, like there, there are two ways this could have gone. And, and one is we get that volatility in ERCON, which could still happen, but we just haven't seen it yet. That would provide the right price signal for more generators, more uh, larger thermal generators that aren't uh, wind or solar um, and actually can run a bit more reliably, encourage them to come into the stack. Now we're starting to get those opposite price signals with that forward curve coming off a little bit for next summer and then even beyond there. So those generators are not, or those potential generation developers aren't getting the price signal to put more generation um, into the stack for ERCOT. So the way I look at this is that we might get, be getting through this summer, but the fact that we're getting through this summer without these big price spikes just even makes next summer a little bit more risky. Um, and then of course you need to have demand showing up need to have some overlap of generation outages, um, winds not showing up. So there's a lot of things that need to happen in order to get that incredible real-time price volatility. But the fact that you're seeing the curve come off right now just means more so that that risk is staying on the table for future summers. And it's almost like kicking the can down the road. If we're not going to deal with it now, uh, we're going to maybe it'll happen and, and come through next summer. So that's, that's the way I look at it. Yes, it, it does look uh, bearish on this summer for a cut on the curve, but but to put that in context for what that means for next summer, it's, it's not the same story. And, and I think there's some, certainly some bullish risks if you're looking at uh, June, July, August for, for COT in 2019. Yeah, I think what Joe said, you know, about kicking the can down the road and risk, uh, I think that's a really good, you know, as we, as we kind of come to the end of, the, of our presentation and kind of our, our big takeaways, um, I think that's really the, you know, that's kind of my view on the market right now. Um, there's not a lot, you know, as I was saying about headroom, it doesn't really exist right now. So we can kick the can down the road and we can wait to see if there's an opportunity for savings that comes down the road. But it's not all, from my point of view, you know, when you're, when you're talking to your customers and you're saying, you know, what's the best thing for us to be doing for you? It's not always how much money can I save you? It's how much risk can I avoid you having to take on? How much, how much money can I not have you spend um, by avoiding that risk? And so while we could sit here and say, well, there's no headroom, I shouldn't be locking into a contract, I would be arguing that, you know, based on current market conditions with gas in a, a, a relatively stable position now, therefore our forward curves in a relatively stable position now, uh, it's a good time to be taking risk off the table, particularly as we start to look to where, towards that next potential high volatility season, which is going to be the winter of 18-19. Um, can we get that locked in? Can we get that taken off the table so that, um, yeah, things seem okay now, but that doesn't mean that they're going to stay that way going into the future. Um, there's always changes to the grid. There's always changes to infrastructure going on, um, not to mention the geopolitical 
uh, impact that decisions make. You know, OPEC decides to curtail or, or increase production. Um, you know, tariffs. You know, there's all sorts of things going on in the geopolitical spectrum. And so I think, you know, when I look at right now where the opportunity is, it's really to get that peace of mind um, so that I don't have to be worried when I go to bed. If I'm a business owner that I, I manufacture widgets, I don't need to be worried about are my energy costs going to skyrocket. Maybe I'm paying a little more than what the utility is offering right now, but the utility is only going to offer me that for the next week, for the next month, or the next six months. They're not going to offer me that long-term security that I can gain through entering into a retail contract. So if I was talking to, to customers on a day-in, day-out basis, that would really be the, the point that I would be saying is, let's not kick the can down the road and try to time the market perfectly and buy the cheapest power possible. But instead, let's say, does this fit into my long-term budget projections, and my long-term planning? And can I take that risk off the table and get back to focused on making widgets instead of talking about energy prices? Because Unless you're Joe and I, talking about energy prices aren't that exciting. <laughs> um, uh, we'll circle back and give a, you know, another kind of wrap up towards the end. Um, we've gotten one question in. Again, if anybody else has any questions that you'd like to lob in, um, please do so in the next couple of minutes. Um, and this is a really good question. Um, and the, the question is, is there a correlation between natural gas prices and crude oil, uh, crude oil prices? And it's a great question because they're both petrochemicals. Um, they're both, uh, uh, you know, developed and drilled for, produced, uh, and refined by the same types of companies, right? Your, your big oil producing companies, whether it's domestic or international. Um, and historically, the answer to that question is yes, there has been a very high correlation between natural gas prices and crude oil prices. And the reason being that, um, there, when you drill for oil, there's something called associated gas, which is you drill for oil, you're producing oil, but you're also getting natural gas out of that well. So uh, if oil prices are high, I'm going to be drilling for more, oil, for more oil, I'm going to be producing more oil and therefore more natural gas. Um, the other reason being that, you know, as I was saying, it's the same companies that drill and produce oil and natural gas. Uh, and so if one price goes higher, that's what they're going to go focus on. And so they, they've historically worked in lockstep. Now, that's not as tightly correlated recently as it has been in the past. And the reason for that is the change in technology for how to drill for natural gas. Um, so a lot, most of the natural gas that we're producing in the United States currently uh, is shale gas. And so shale are very thin layers of um, rocks, uh, thin being, you know, 100 feet uh, at, at the largest. Um, they stretch horizontally for very long, uh, long distances. Uh, in the past, you drilled down to hit a, an oil field or a gas field. And then the, the gas or oil would escape out that, that well hole. Um, with new technologies, we've, in, we've, we now have the ability to drill horizontally. So we can actually steer the drill bit as it goes down and hits the right depth. We hit that shale bed. We can now turn it horizontally. So instead of moving down, we're now moving across and we can exploit more of that gas field. Um, that's really opened up a lot of natural gas that is not associated gas. So it's distinctly gas fields, particularly in Pennsylvania, um, you know, Ohio, uh, the Bakken in, in, in North Dakota, uh, or in the Dakotas, um, are these new, not new fields, they've been known for, for years, you know, decades, people have known about these fields but didn't have the technology to exploit them. Um, so that technological change has, has brought that um, a little bit of a, a the correlation has lessened between those two prices. With that being said, um, they are still very highly correlated. It's not as direct of a correlation as it used to be. Um, next question coming in, uh, kind of a, a, a tangent on this is, uh, is oil considered a substitute for natural gas? Um, and it, it depends on what, uh, in what application. Um, so if you think about uh, like my car, for example, I can't 
put natural gas into my car and have my car run successfully on that. It needs oil or, or an oil product, which is gasoline. Um, on the power production side, that's a different story. So uh, a lot of plants are what we call dual fuel capable. So while they're designed to, to burn natural gas, they have the capability to burn oil, uh, heating oil specifically, um, to produce power. And so there is some uh, overlap in, in, in that way. Um, you know, there are propane fired vehicles, but in the transportation sector, it's pretty bifurcated and there are, there are oil burning and there are um, uh, gas burning, natural gas burning. Uh, in the power sector, there's a little bit more of a, a gray area. And particularly in the wintertime, like New England in particular, uh, you'll see a lot of those dual fuel fire or dual, dual fuel capability plants switch to oil when natural gas prices spike due to it being, you know, three degrees outside here. Um, so yeah, um, that's the question on that. Um, so then we have a, a good uh, kind of a, a scenario to talk about. And, and these are the kind of questions that we love and I think, you know, uh, we'd love to see more of. So the question is, uh, a customer in Texas that's going through the going through the summer out of a contract, right? So they are exposed to the real time market. We've just been talking about it. That could be really scary, uh, and it could be, you know we could see the the prices spike. Question is, since they're paying eight to cent, ten cents per kilowatt hour right now in the summertime, should they wait until the fall to shop for electricity, or should they bite the bullet and get under a contract now? It's a great question, and I don't know if we have a perfect answer to it, but we can start to talk about what the what the good and the bad on both sides of that. So as Joe was just talking about, um, we haven't seen any of that that big volatility in Texas yet, right? If that volatility occurs, I would expect for that to get pushed into next year's pricing as well, right? So haven't seen that volatility. The market's traded off. That's transferred into next summer as well, right? So we saw this summer spike up to that, you know, almost $250 in August. The next summer, so summer of 2019, we saw start to run up. It was correlated. It wasn't to the same magnitude, but it was running up in that same way. Just as we've started to see August prices roll off in 2018, we've seen the same thing happen in summer of 2019. Now that's been with no volatility, no real volatility, right? Eight, 10 cents a kilowatt hour in Texas is pretty high, but it's not, you know, eight or $10 a kilowatt hour, which a $9,000 price would, would translate into. Um, so if we do see that volatility, that's going to reflect not just in this summer, but also into next summer's prices as well. So we wait till the fall, we see some volatility. Next summer's prices are going to be bid up a little bit. There's, you're going to kind of, it, from my point of view, I would say you're going to get you're going to you're going to get it coming and going in that sense, right? You're going to pay for being exposed to the market this year, and you're going to be paying to lock in on that higher price next year. So my point of view would be to not kick the can down the road and to look for that opportunity where there's a good contract to be locking in and taking that risk off the table so that you're not looking at uh, going into next summer exposed to the market again, right? If you're constantly looking for that perfect time to buy, you're never gonna find it. Uh, Joe, anything to add or any color to, to put in on that? Yeah, just another thing I'd toss in there is that when we talk about ERCOT, we typically focus on the summers, but winter can also be a big deal for ERCOT as well. We saw um, some very volatile days just this past January, um, and we've yet to see a full winter in our with all these stack or generation retirements. So there's still a lot of uncertainty, in my opinion, on what the ERCOT winter looks like. So it's, it's maybe if we do get through the summer, like the, the curve comes off a little bit more and um, things are looking cheaper, but we're just going to turn right around and head into the winter facing the same set of bullish risks. And then as we talked about summer 2019 uh, a lot already, but I just wanted to throw in the fact that the winters are also a risk as well. And um, if anything's undervalued, those winters are undervalued, um, in my opinion, for ERCOT. So follow-on question to that is, you know, is there is there an ideal time of the year to fix in pricing for electricity for electricity in Texas? Um, 
and, and I'll caveat this answer. Uh, yes, uh, is is my my simple answer to that question, and that's going to be uh, your shoulder season. So your fall and your spring. So in Texas, you're looking kind of March, April uh, as your spring season. Um, in your fall season, you're looking kind of that October, November, maybe into December a little bit. Now, with that being said, um, you know, as a broker or a consultant to your customer, you're helping them manage risk in a market that they don't really have a lot of understanding about. Uh, when I worked with customers, what I was always trying to do is I was always trying to think about the next contract two buying seasons ahead of time. Uh, so to, to, to clarify that, um, in the situation we were just talking about, the customer is exposed to the market. We need to get them unexposed to the market. So let's get a contract in place now. Let's put them on a year, one year contract. Then this fall and next spring, I can be looking for a good opportunity, right? Say we go through the summer and there is no, uh, no pricing event. And so next year rolls off even further. Well, I might lock in more, uh, a longer contract, another year contract on top of that this fall. If not, maybe I wait, we go through the winter, there's no volatility. I always like to be looking two, two shoulders ahead um, to be taking risk off the table because if you come out of a, if we come out of this summer and there's been a bunch of $9,000 price time period uh, this summer, everything's going to be expensive, right? The, that's going to, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats. I don't know exactly how the saying goes, but every price is going to be higher. I'm not going to want to lock in at that time period. I want to lock in when there's been very little volatility. So I would be thinking, okay, I'm not going to do anything this, this fall, but I want to be thinking about, well, hopefully I can go through the spring and be locked in, get, you know, uh, go through the winter, not have any volatility. You see the whole thing, the whole market kind of settle down into that spring season, and that's when I would be looking to lock things in. Does it always work out that way? Most definitely no. But looking out, you know, a year and a half into the future for a contract, so three shoulder seasons, there's just not a lot of good price discovery, and a lot of companies, in my experience, don't want to be making financial decisions that far out, you know, signing a two-year contract that doesn't start for a year and a half. Um, but if you start looking a year down the road, you start to get into that, you know, that horizon isn't that far away. So you can say, hey, you know, over this next year, let's look for an opportunity to lock in the following year's contract and to just have this rolling cycle of I'm looking in the shoulder seasons for opportunities to lock my customer in longer term. Uh, and over time, you build that trust with your customer uh, and you're, you're, you're really acting as a risk manager for that customer and helping them manage their exposure to the market, right? We all have, if you, if, unless you have solar on your rooftop or a diesel generator, we all have exposure to the electricity market in one way or the other. Me as a homeowner, I have exposure to the electricity market. If I'm manufacturing something, I have a bigger exposure to that market. And as a, a consultant, an aggregator, a, a broker, um, you're helping your customers manage that risk and so you want to help them. They have an exposure. So, you know, on the trading side, we call that a short position. They are short to the market. They have to buy from the market. If they lock in a contract, they now have a long position. And if you get those to balance, which a retail contract uh, is inherently designed to do, then they don't have any risk or exposure to the market and any volatility in the market. And so I always look out, you know, two shoulder seasons to be locking in customers. The long answer to a, a shorter question, um, but that's kind of my general theory, and it's not just on the, the retail side that I think that way, but even on wholesale edges and managing generation, that's the way that we like to look at things, is what's going to be happening, uh, you know, two shoulder seasons from now, and is there is there a smart decision to make to take risk off the table and, and, and mitigate um, volatility that's going to hurt me, right? As load, I don't want volatility to the upside. As generation, I don't want volatility to the downside. Um, so that's what I'm looking at when I'm looking at, at, at hedging strategies, is how do I take that risk off the table um, and, and not necessarily make the most money or get the best price, but how do I manage that risk the best? Um, and especially with you guys talking to, to end-use customers every day that are um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, relatively uneducated about how this market works. 
Um, helping them take that risk off the table is the best service that I think that we can provide as an industry. Um, with that being said, uh, I think we've wrapped up questions. Um, you know, I think, again, our, our takeaway right now is, hey, be thinking about taking some risk off the table. Prices are not bad. Um, could they get a little bit better? Sure. But much more likely that they could get a lot worse. And so look to take that risk off the table, um, particularly if you have customers with exposure uh, in the fall or winter of this year, and even starting to think about next summer. Um, what, what can you be doing to, to mitigate risk for your, for your customers next summer? Um, if you guys have any additional questions, uh, please reach out to your uh, uh, support member at Box. Uh, if there's anything that they're not able, or any specific market questions, they'll pass those along to us. Uh, thanks for your time, uh, Joan. I appreciate it, and look forward to talking to you again next month. And with that, Emily, we'll hand it over to you. All right. Thanks. I'd like to thank Elliot and Joe for sharing with us today, and everyone for joining. If you have any questions that weren't answered, just email your account manager or broker support at brokeronlineexchange.com. Also, if you have any specific topics that you'd like to see our analysts cover next time, send that over to us as well. Thanks again, everyone, and we hope you join us next month.